I would like to introduce AFSIS president and uh, today's host, Ambassador Eric Rubin. Welcome, Eric. Thank you very much, Nadia, and thank you very much to everyone for joining us today. Um, this is our Inside Diplomacy virtual series that takes a look at key questions facing our country, facing our diplomats, facing our members in the Foreign Service. And I think it's it's not only quite possible, but maybe likely that today's topic is, I think the, the most burning question, and I, I say that uh, intentionally, um, it is truly a critical set of issues. And we're very lucky uh, to have the OAS Assistant Secretary of State with us today. Um, let me just say a few words about AFSA. Um, we're very grateful for uh, all of you who are members and your dues support everything we do. Uh, if there are people on the call who aren't members, welcome. You are most welcome. If you're eligible to join as a member or a former member of the Foreign Service, please think about doing so. It's a very good uh, bargain, we think, given what you get. Um, even if you're not a member of the Foreign Service or a former member of the Foreign Service, you're eligible to join as an associate member uh, and get our monthly magazine and our daily media digest and all the other products we provide, including uh, programming like this. So just a membership pitch because... That's my job. But with that, I'd like to uh, get started on what I hope will be a really good discussion today. And it is really our privilege to be able to welcome Monica Medina uh, today to our Inside Diplomacy event. Uh, she was confirmed as Assistant Secretary for Oceans and International Environmental and Scientific Affairs on September 28th, 2021. In addition to her duties as Assistant Secretary, she was also designated by Secretary Blinken as the Special Envoy for Biodiversity and Water Resources, uh, as a sign of the administration's commitment to resolving the world's intertwined biodiversity and water crises. Uh, previously, Assistant Secretary Medina was an adjunct professor at Georgetown School of Foreign Service. She was a senior associate on the Stevenson Ocean Security Project at CSIS, co-founder and publisher of our Daily Planet, an e-newsletter on conservatism, uh, conservatism I'm sorry, conservation and the environment. Um, she's also a former principal uh, deputy undersecretary of commerce for oceans and atmosphere. Uh, she served as general counsel of NOAA and a special assistant to the secretary of defense. And earlier she served as senior counsel to former Senator Max Baucus on the Senate Environment and Public Works Committee. Uh, and also as the Senior Director for Ocean Policy at National Geographic. Uh, and she's also uh, the Ocean Lead at the Walton Family Foundation and played important roles in other uh, NGOs and environmental organizations. So that's quite a bio. We are very lucky to have you today, Assistant Secretary Medina. And um, I just want to say on behalf of all of us, thanks for making the time. And I look forward to what I hope will be a really good discussion on this really critical set of issues. So with that, let me hand it over to you for some initial remarks. Wonderful. Thank you all. Thanks, Eric, for Ambassador, for um, inviting me to be here this morning. Uh, and I want to say a quick thank you to everyone on the on the line because I now, in my first tour at the State Department, have a really tremendous appreciation for the role of the Foreign Service and Foreign Service officers and. And what a wonderful community and what a great thing it is that you bring everyone together, all alumna um, together as well. Um, this uh, wonderful group of people will really help us in OES um, get the word out, spread the word on the mission that we do. And I know all of you are still diplomats, even if you're not in the foreign service anymore, you're still helping us represent our country so well. And we really appreciate your um, interest in our topic and your willingness to, to talk about it with your friends and colleagues, um, because that is how I think we raise awareness about these issues, and it's a critical time to do that. So I'm really looking forward to discussing our priorities, some of the big, uh, exciting things that we've managed to accomplish in the last few months, and our challenges going forward. We have a lot of work still to do on issues of climate change and biodiversity and pollution, the US is fully committed under President Biden and you know, throughout uh, the, the administration. It's really a whole of government effort, which makes it so exciting to be a part of it and to actually be um, able to represent 
us in international uh, arenas on these issues. And it's just an exciting time to be doing environmental work. It's, it's daunting. It could be more urgent and more important, but it's also a time of great change and great um, progress. So I'm excited to talk with you all about that today and just thrilled to have a chance to do this job in this incredible uh, department with so many wonderful Foreign Service officers, both here in OES and our ESTH officers around the world and all of uh, you all who still, are, as I said, are representing our country as diplomats wherever you are. So uh, back over to you, Eric. Great, thank you. Okay, so um, we have a lot of questions and let me um, then ask Nadia to uh, lead the way with our first question. Thank you, Ambassador Rubin. So our first question is, um, and you've, you've hinted at this, the Biden administration has placed a lot of emphasis on restoring US global leadership on global challenges such as climate change, ocean, uh, biodiversity conversation, plastic pollution, and nature crimes. Please tell us more about the global USG effort and where OES fits into that picture. It's a great question. I get it a lot because we have a lot of people working on it, which is fantastic from my perspective. The climate crisis is one of the defining challenges of our time. And we as Americans are in a really good spot. We have come back to the table. We are back, fully back in countries. We're so glad to see us back and absolutely you know, engaged uh, on this issue because it is really important for us to lead the world. Um, not only because we are historically the largest emitter, but also because right now with our bipartisan infrastructure bill and the Inflation Reduction Act, we are leading the way on how to solve the problem. And so, I mean, this didn't all happen overnight. It has been a real effort by the administration and the president made it a priority in his campaign and on day one of the administration when he issued an executive order um, within a few days of taking office that put the climate crisis at the center, at the center of US foreign policy and national security. And the instruction he gave in that executive order is crystal clear. It also makes it front and center to everything that we do here at the State Department, which is why it's wonderful to have a secretary. Oh, sorry, my lights. This is the climate crisis. <laughs> <laughs> we have light sensors here. And even though I'm moving, sometimes they just turn off. So apologies if I go dark. It's not because no. I'm, not, I'm not here. Um, <laughs> we have climate. Uh, we have wonderful champions on uh, climate change issues from the secretary, myself, and Spec Carey, what, a, what an amazing thing yeah. to have the ability to have three diplomats, two really top diplomats able to take these issues on. And of course, climate is related to almost everything else I do and we do in this OES Bureau, whether it's health, because we know that um, the health crisis is, li is linked uh, to biodiversity loss and we need to solve the biodiversity loss crisis. We can solve the climate crisis by rebuilding and um, protecting nature, and we can solve uh, future pandemics by doing the same thing. Yeah. That's fantastic. And we solve the biodiversity crisis at the same time, so it's a triple win. Um, oceans couldn't be more important. The ocean is the largest carbon sink on the planet. Oceans is in our name. We, that's what we do here at OES. Um, and uh, even our space and science role is so um, pivotal to what we're doing in climate change because um, we can't really observe and understand the impact that climate is having without the satellites in space and without the perspective that looking at the planet from outer space gives us and the science that we need to solve the problems because we don't even have all the technologies in place that we need to actually tackle the, the crisis and keep us within that 1.5 degrees Celsius. So these things are interrelated. OES's work um, Climate is a crosscut. It's also a big part of what we do. And people often ask us, um, you know, how does the SPEC team interact with the OES team? And what I can tell you is like this, hand in glove. Um, it's wonderful to actually have a chance to work with Secretary Kerry this closely. I've worked with him numerous other times in my career, but mostly just sort of one of those people supporting him. And now it gets, it's really an honor and a privilege to get to work with him so closely. I um, am fortunate to get to uh, 
um, be his uh, understudy at a lot of um, events that he can't squeeze in. And of course, a big team uh, within OES is part of the SPEC team. So while they're here, they're also in support directly of SPEC carry. And they work seamlessly with his team that he brought in when uh, he began the job a few, um, uh, two years ago. Um, so, you know, what else do we do in OES that has an impact on climate? We work on transboundary pollution, air pollution. These greenhouse gases are big air pollution uh, polluters as well, and there are global agreements covering them. We work to disrupt international criminal networks in illegal fishing, mining, logging, and wildlife trade. We create uh, broader agreements that cover climate change and biodiversity loss, agreements like the Convention on Biological Diversity, again, where nature is 30% of the solution for climate, and we have now come up with a framework for actually saving nature across the planet, which is great. We also forge cooperation on, on space and space exploration. Again, a key part of our future is space and working with partners, bringing other countries uh, with us as we go to the moon and go to Mars is a great way for us to not only expand our diplomatic efforts, but also to expand their ability to help us solve the climate crisis by all the observations that we're gonna get from space. And um, one more that's really important to us right now is the plastic agreement. There's an agreement um, that we're working on today on um, stemming the crisis in plastic pollution. Uh, we are drowning in plastic around the world. Plastic is a carbon. It's a product of carbon. So we know it's important to, um, to stem this crisis, not only because of the impacts it has in our oceans or in water and landfills, but also because it's a big part of solving the climate crisis. Um, and last but not least, we are really focused on environmental justice and making sure that we hear from the people around the world whose voices have not always been heard, that we lift them up and that we, we work with them to learn from them because they know how the climate crisis is hitting them in ways that um, help us to understand it better. And we understand their traditional knowledge that can also help us with pathways to be successful in controlling um, the emissions that we have by rebuilding nature and seeing the way that they in traditional communities have held on to nature, have conserved it, have coveted nature um, in a way that we need to replicate. Uh, and so um, it's been a really, really busy time. And I just want to end by saying um, this past weekend, we had a big uh, success. For more than 15 years, the world had been talking about creating an agreement that would be cross-sectoral in the deep sea, the parts of the ocean that are beyond national jurisdiction. So from 200 miles in belongs to each country. We have the right under the Law of the Sea Convention to um, have uh, our commerce there protected. Um, but out in the high seas, 200 miles and beyond, which is half the planet. We only had sector by sector uh, agreements covering the way countries could use the resources there. Now we have a cross sectoral agreement that provides for protection of areas in the marine high seas. Because if we don't protect those, we won't be able to keep the planet healthy. And we have no legal mechanism to do that until now, we've agreed on the text of this incredibly important treaty. Um, it's part of the Law of the Sea Convention. It took um, a Herculean effort by the OES team to get it over the finish line. We've been trying to actually finish the agreement for more than a year after about 15 years of discussion, more, more or less 10 years of actual negotiation. It took a Herculean effort, a superhero-like effort by a team of people led by OES, but including our lawyers and L and an interagency team that was phenomenal. And they worked 40 hours straight last weekend. Just this time last week, we were all camped out in the UN and it was like a lock-in because we were all afraid we would lose our privileges to come back into the UN if we left. So people stayed for 40 hours straight and negotiated through and we managed to come together the whole world and I want to emphasize that the whole world with 
maybe one country an exception, um, the whole world came together in support of the language of this agreement. And so it's a really exciting time, as I said, this is a, a moment in environmental conservation that I think we won't see the likes of again for a while, but we needed it to save the planet. So I'll, um, I'll turn it back over to you. Next question, I guess. Well, congratulations. I don't know if you can see all the uh, responses we're getting of applause and hearts and, um, oh, and uh, yes. So I think everyone here is well aware of what a monumental step this was. So congratulations. Thank you. So as, as if you weren't busy enough, um, as the Assistant Secretary of OES, you were appointed a special envoy for biodiversity and water resources back in September. Um, this means that the State Department is putting these issues even higher on the foreign uh, policy priorities list. You've, you've hinted or you've gone over, I think, the list already, but um, tell us more about what this appointment especially means in practice and what are the top priorities that you and your team are really looking at right now? Thank you. And that's a great question. And I, um, I hope uh, what the world sees by this appointment, and it's not really about me, it's about having someone in this job focused 100% of the time on nature, biodiversity, water resources, which are important, really pivotal to the climate crisis, but also important for solving this biodiversity crisis. And it says to countries that may not be the biggest emitters, but who have an awful lot of biodiversity and nature benefits that they can donate to the, to the, um, to the uh, solutions for climate, that we care about them too, that we have someone looking out for them. It's hard for Spec Harry to cover all of these climate issues, especially ones that have these secondary and um, third order uh, benefits as well as, um, as you know, having a, a second person who can, who can do that. And it matters in things like the UN um, Sustainable Development Goals because those goals are, are very broad. They of course include you know, um, solving the climate crisis and, and equity issues and justice and many, many, uh, and, and development, many things, but, um, but nature and biodiversity and water are really, really important, pivotal to all underpin a lot of those other sustainable development goals. So it sends a really strong signal that we mean it when we say we care about conserving 30% of the planet by 2030. Even though we're not a member of that particular convention, we intend to live up to that pledge. And it's one the president made during the campaign, which was fantastic, that the US itself would achieve those 30 by 30, those ambitious goals but also that we would help other countries do the same. And so with someone in a, in a position to be able to represent the US at all the various important international meetings, there's one on water resources coming up at the end of this month, that takes a little bit of the pressure off Sec Secretary Kerry to kind of cover this entire landscape of issues that matter to climate. Um, and it gives us a boost in those conversations uh, that we have with other countries. I'm looking forward, for example, to going to Pakistan next week and having conversations about these issues there. So it's, it's an exciting time and it's a, a good signal to the rest of the world that we understand that we're gonna solve the climate crisis by having a really multifaceted approach. Um, a coordinated response is really the only way to stem the crisis. I've heard it described as, you know, all hands on deck. There's no one country uh, or entity that can do it on its own. So who are the key partners um, in the work that you are doing? And then the second part of this question, um, how do we find common ground with some of these countries? Obviously, there are different stages of development than we are. How do we incentivize uh, work on this in order to achieve the ambitious goals that we have set? Well, I think when we think about partnership, we think about it very broadly um, because uh, that's the key to multilateralism, right? Yeah. Um, and, and I think even thinking about it beyond other countries really matters. There are a lot of stakeholders that have tremendous amount of influence both on other governments and on the issues themselves because of the work that they do. A lot of companies have a huge potential to be a part of the solution. I'll talk about mm -hmm. that in a minute. But when, it, when I think about our partners, it's really wonderful. Um, over the last year that I've been in this position, I've developed a really great relationship with a group of other ministers who are like me, focused on 
not only climate, but also biodiversity, nature, water resources. And they are um, uh, representative of, you know, probably every part of the planet, every ecosystem and every um, key area that we need to conserve. So it's been a great way for us to work together um, to achieve these goals. You know, I think people have been surprised, frankly, that we've been able to get such agreement around plastic pollution, 30 by 30, mm -hmm. and now ocean conservation. But uh, it is because we've developed good, strong relationships with countries from all over the world, whether it's in Africa or in uh, the Pacific Islands or um, in obviously our more you know, typical friends in Europe. Um, we really have, uh, I think, worked very, very closely to try to understand each other's perspectives, to, to make sure that we're thinking about the justice and um, the, the equity issues and that we're responsive as much as we can. And I think you'll see even more of that over the um, months to come as we think about how to reform or evolve financial institutions that are going to pay for a lot of the work that we need to mm -hmm. do, something that we've heard a lot about uh, from developing countries. But that's only part of the story. Another big part of the story is doing outreach to um, organizations that can be uh, very helpful in achieving our goals, to businesses that can be very helpful in achieving our goals. Um, the NGOs uh, who were part of um, a big coalition called the High Seas Coalition, this is just one example, were super helpful in thinking about uh, how to achieve the important agreement last weekend on the high seas. Um, and we heard from industry as well, from the biotech industry that had a huge stake in how we share the um, benefits of uh, marine genetic resources outside of national jurisdictions. Really important area for the future. And so we were keen to hear from them and to take their views into account, as well as indigenous peoples who yeah. see, you know, these, these voyaging communities in the Pacific said, the high seas may seem like, you know, no man's land to you, but that's our backyard. That's how we think about our world is as an integral part of those high seas areas, connecting those islands in ways that we, you know, probably don't fully appreciate, but for centuries for them, and so it was really a phenomenal way to bring people together. And I'll say we need it, especially when it comes to solving the plastic crisis and particularly the expertise of entrepreneurs and um, innovators and businesses who have a stake in solving the plastic crisis, the plastic pollution crisis. So we're hoping to actually intensify our work with public-private um, partners mm -hmm. on the plastic agreement going forward. So. Partnership is a key part yeah. of what we do in OES. We couldn't solve these global problems without making strong partnerships um, in government, in private sector, and uh, philanthropic organizations and, and businesses. Uh, the COP27, which was the UN climate um, summit this past November, it was billed as the conference for implementation and adaptation. Um, so one, I'm curious to know if it was, uh, if it was as billed, if it lived up to its reputation. And also, can you just please tell us more about your role or OES role in, uh, at the COP and then key outcomes and updates since November? Sure. Well, it, it is, I think, evolving. You know, the COPs are becoming enormous meetings. I mean, they've yeah. grown even since 2019, which was my first COP. I was there as, a, as an NGO, as an observer. And to what I have, saw, have seen in the last um, COP, it's bigger and more dynamic and more multifaceted, um, really looking at um, a broad spectrum of issues, adaptation issues, so important. I think it's mm -hmm. clearer now more than ever. And we're hearing from countries that, yes, while we have to mitigate, mitigate, mitigate in order to you know, keep within 1.5 degrees, we can't just say, oh, well, we'll get to adaptation later because we've got this other priority. We have to do both at the same time. We can no longer, um, I think, uh, sort of think that the climate crisis is somewhere down in the future. It is today, right now. And, you know, just look at Pakistan and yeah. um, our West Coast and, um, and, you know, the extremes we're seeing in the Arctic and the Antarctic. We know the crisis is today. And so yeah. while we have to continue to have um, really, you know, full 
force of, you know, of um, our efforts on mitigation, we also have had to add and expand the dialogue to include adaptation fully in it. And I think, um, you know, hats off to the leadership in Egypt in this last COP and African um, countries in general who really pushed for adaptation to be a big part of that COP. And I think that will continue to grow. Um, looking ahead, the next COP is the stock take COP. Um, it's where we stop and say, are we on track to getting uh, to where we need to go? Do our nationally developed contributions, NDC plans, our national action plans on climate, do they add up to enough to, to keep within 1.5 as we know the science today? And are countries actually living up to their promises? And we know there are some countries that need to do more. And can we use this moment to, to um, really drive those countries who have more to do to, to um, make the contributions that they should. And so it's an important COP. Again, it's in the same part of the world. It's in an interesting place because it's in a country that's known for oil and gas and a region of the world that's known for oil and gas. So I think that will put the spotlight on them to show how they get it that this is a moment in which we have to make changes. And of course, they're also in a hot part of the world. So I know yes. they're feeling the, the heat, if you will, at the same time. So it'll be a very, very interesting COP. Um, I know Spec Carey's already been over to sort of begin conversations about, about it. And I expect that um, it will be dynamic. It will be an, um, a one where the world will be watching us more than probably ever because we will be doing this Sort of assessment of where we are. How's the patient? You know, taking the, the planet's temperature. Are we doing all the things we need to do to lower our risks of even worse ca catastrophe? And um, and at the same time, are we doing all the things we need to right now to put people more out of harm's way than they already are in adaptation and resilience and um, being ready for what we know is baked into the system already in terms of warming. So now that we've discussed a lot of the opportunities and the exciting things happening right now, what are some of the key challenges that lie ahead? And um, what do you see as the role of OES and uh, our diplomats in addressing those challenges? I think um, the challenges ahead are daunting, but the right ones. It's time for us to address the plastic pollution crisis that we see worldwide. And the Washington Post had a story yesterday that just, I mean, again, puts an exclamation point at the end of the plastic pollution crisis. There are, for every person on this planet, all 8 billion of them, 21,000 pieces of plastic per person in the ocean. Trillions of pieces of plastic in the ocean. We know you can find it from the Arctic to the Antarctic and at the bottom of the Marianas Trench, the deepest part of the ocean. We know plastic is now so pervasive that we have got to do something about it. And we only have another 18 months or so uh, to do it. We, um, a year ago, just a year ago now, this week, agreed to begin negotiations of a plastic agreement, a global one. I'm hopeful that it will be a lot like the Paris Agreement, national action plans that allow for flexibility in countries to solve the problem in ways that make sense for them, but help hold us to a very ambitious standard. And in that case, I hope the standard will be that we are going to work to eliminate plastic pollution in the environment by 2040. That's a really ambitious target. I hope we can get a global agreement on that. We have one negotiating session under our belt that happened last November in Uruguay. I was there, it was a very exciting um, beginning, but uh, again, we have a lot of work to do. We have four more sessions. The next one is uh, in May and uh, we need to make significant progress at each one. Fortunately, the US is a member of the Bureau, which is you know, the lead negotiating group. And uh, we have a fantastic lead negotiator. Her name is Lark Williams. Um, she's really, truly talented and one of the most patient and uh, uh, persistent people I know, probably only next to Elizabeth Kim, who negotiated that Aries Beyond National Jurisdiction High Seas Agreement. I mean, what, what a thing to have these two fantastic women leading these negotiations at this key moment for the United States government. 
So OES will be center in, at front and center in that negotiation. We'll draw in another large interagency team of experts from EPA to the National Science Foundation. We'll bring along a lot of partners from the private sector, as I said, businesses, universities, um, entrepreneurs, I hope, will, will come, you know, innovators who can help us solve the, the problem. And, uh, and hopefully with the four negotiating sessions left, we can get ourselves all the way to a, a framework agreement that will um, get us to that really important 2040 goal of eliminating plastic pollution in the environment. So uh, it, it is a very, very important time ahead. And when I think about the, the things that have been really significant, obviously climate change, climate cops continuing to, and our, our domestic effort on climate, um, because now we can fully say we're solving our part of the problem and we want other countries to do the same. But then the Convention on Biological Diversity, that 30% goal, so important for us to conserve the planet. The Areas Beyond National Jurisdiction Treaty and the ocean, so important. We can't get to 30% on the planet if 50% couldn't have any way to be protected. So now we've got that in place. And I think the linchpin will be this plastic agreement. We can get that done by the end of 2024, that will be, I think, put us in, in much better uh, place for solving the big challenges that are the ones we'll be dealing with for the next decades. So speaking of challenges, the Ukraine-Russia conflict has resulted in significant damage to the environment and a setback in climate uh, change efforts or in climate efforts, I guess. Um, how is your team engaging on these issues and what happens if the war goes on for even longer than expected? Well, I'll say that um, we are dealing with it, you know, as, as it comes. Uh, when the war first began, we were at that big negotiation, the UNEA 5.2 meeting, where we agreed on the plastic uh, negotiations, um, starting that plastic agreement negotiation. And um, the world is really united. I think, if anything, sort of the bigger picture um, uh, sort of impacts, ripple effects of the war are to make countries even more determined to work multilaterally and to cooperate than ever before. It also changes the way we think about how we set up the mechanisms within those agreements. So like in the areas beyond national jurisdiction agreement, this high seas treaty, we made a point of not um, doing anything. Uh, maybe there's a few bits. I have to go back and look, but we, we tried to avoid consensus-based decision-making as much as possible because we didn't want one country, Russia, to be able to stymie progress. Um, I will say that we are trying to find ways to be constructive in the Arctic Council, which had been a place um, where there was a lot of US-Russia cooperation on science in the Arctic, um, in particular, uh, before the war. Russia is currently the chair, and we basically all the rest of the countries in the council have stood down during this time of Russia's chairmanship. In this um, very upcoming month or two, Russia will transition its chairmanship to Norway, I believe, and that's good. Um, it will allow us to at least begin work that we can do without Russia, um, and I think uh, that is possible. Um, that we can make some progress on things that um, where Russia wasn't part of the of the activity anyway, then we're going to move ahead. Um, and uh, we'll be looking for other ways to try to counter Russia's, um, uh, you know, throwing up some roadblocks in our way, for example, um, you know, uh, in the um, in the uh, agreement that the BBNJ agreement, we may see a Russia vote no on uh, on that agreement. We haven't, while we've, been, while we've agreed on the text, we're still waiting for all the tran translations to be done. So there'll be an adoption of the text. That'll be the next step. And Russia might vote no, but fortunately it's a vote. And, and we are confident um, now that uh, there's support for, there's a sufficient support for adoption of that agreement. So we continue to work with countries um, all over the world to try to make sure that we can make progress, even as the war uh, in, in Ukraine, the heinous uh, war in Ukraine continues. And we will also be there to help the Ukrainian people restore their environment. And we've already been doing assessments. We've been working closely with the UN and the Ukrainian government to help them understand how much damage 
the war has caused to their environment, things like their clean drinking water, um, land contamination, there's, there's going to be a huge amount of, uh, of restoration work to be done in the Ukraine, and we will be there with our Ukrainian colleagues and um, friends uh, every step of the way. So uh, because we are uh, the American Foreign Service Association, we have to ask a question about are our foreign service officers. As we've discussed, there's so much uh, renewed global commitment to tackling this crisis. Um, even with the increased goodwill and commitment, it will just require unprecedented levels of global cooperation, everything that we've discussed um, thus far on this program. Um, so of course our diplomats will have to be front and center in a lot of this. What does this mean for our diplomats? Are they well positioned, resources, resourced, equipped, trained um, to, to tackle this or to take this on, to carry this? I think we're making a good case uh, for increased resources. Um, we saw that in the last year, we've increased um, ESTH climate directed officers by a um, couple dozen, uh, and we hope to get more of those. We've also seen an increase at the Foreign Service, um, I guess it's called the Academy, anyway, the, the Institute, uh, institute yeah. um, uh, of a lot more training classes so that um, people who don't necessarily spend all their time on climate can um, and environment issues can learn them um, and know them and see how they impact uh, their day-to-day -day jobs. I also see an incredible amount of interest among new foreign service officers in these issues. They, I think many people are joining the foreign service in order to help solve these very problems because they are global in nature and it is a pivotal time and they are really interested in making sure that they have a healthy planet for generations to come. And so I'm actually um, very uh, optimistic that, that Secretary Blinken's um, desire to have a, a, you know, a new and more um, dynamic uh, State Department and Foreign Service um, will uh, reflect this change in, and, or put for it, put, um, continue to put, climate change and environmental issues in the center of foreign policy and our and our workforce um, will reflect it going forward. Uh, we continue to ask for more and we will because I think the demand is there. And if we wanna meet countries where they are, we need to have that capacity and we need to grow, um, make sure we're really well linked up with USAID, which is a pivotal part of the work that we do in communities on the ground to make sure that all our development assistance is doing things that are climate and nature positive. So I'm looking at the time and I think it's high time we switched over to um, our audience Q&A. And I think I'm not exaggerating, but they seem to be pouring in these questions. So bear, yeah. bear with me, <laughs> um, bear with me as I uh, look, switch uh, my screens to look at our questions. Okay. So the first question uh, is, what role do you see for public diplomacy in the overall effort to reduce or mitigate the effects of climate change? Well, I think um, diplomacy here, every, there isn't a country in the world that, is, that has no impact, right? It's impacting every country everywhere, every community um, in every country. It's feeling the impact of climate change. And so, it's more important than ever for diplomacy to be leaning forward. I was just getting, like I said, I'm going to Pakistan and I was just seeing the impact of our air quality monitors at the embassy there and how they're helping people there to understand the, you know, really the detrimental health impacts of air pollution and not just greenhouse gases, which are um, invisible, but a lot of the more visible air pollutants. Um, I think we're now helping them see how much pollution there really is. And when you know something, you can change it. And so, um, you know, there are lots of ways that our diplomacy can, um, can impact uh, uh, foreign policy and, and just providing data could be one of the most important. I think uh, the more we can partner with other countries, the more we're um, hearing their needs on adaptation and resilience and trying to meet them, um, the more we can uh, evolve the big 
institutions that have funding that we've donated funding to to be more responsive to the urgency and the needs of um, countries all around the world who aren't big emitters who didn't cause this problem but who are feeling oops there we go who are feeling the impacts of it um the more i think we will be successful and i'll give an example I was in, um, we were at the Our Ocean Conference last year that we co-sponsored with Palau. So in Palau, the Pacific Island nations, uh, I had a what I thought was going to be a simple, hi, hello, here I am, Monica Medina, I work on these issues, um, particularly when it comes to our, we have something called the South Pacific Tuna Treaty, in which we have a special relationship. You, uh, we are the only country with an um, a agreement a treaty with all 14 of them that allows us to work with them to um, uh, provide um, income through uh, them selling us days at sea for and the ability to, to basically catch tuna, which is a, a really important um, marine species, somewhat overfished in some places. So it's one we really care a lot about. And um, they came to us and said, you need to do more. You have not, you, the United States, have not um, increased your work with us uh, in 20 years, and it's time for a change. And that was a real wake-up call. Um, and we have changed our work with them. We have um, increased our support, but we've also increased the amount of assistance we provide in, in ways that is not just, not just um, providing funds. We are increasing the work that we're doing to help um, universities there to grow capacity. Um, we are working with them to create what's called marine spatial plans that help them because they're ocean countries. They're not land countries, they're ocean countries. Their oceans are much bigger than their land base. And so helping them figure out how to have a sustainable blue economy is really, really important. We have a lot of expertise in that area. Um, and so, you know, I think, um, there are lots of ways that we're evolving our foreign policy to meet today. And one of the things we did in this tuna treaty is create actually the ability to help them with climate change, as opposed to just thinking about fishing and extraction. So it's, it's um, I think, uh, happening everywhere all at once, um, little by little uh, in some places and more dramatically in others. And I think that trend will only continue. Uh, the American public is divided about the very existence of climate change, um, which seems to have sort of become a political football. How is the USG addressing questions from our international partners about the consistency of our commitment, uh, given that an election might result in reversing leadership? It's a totally uh, uh, understandable question. We have made some big changes, obviously, from um, vis -vis the previous administration. Uh, I think um, we are working very hard to institutionalize the work, not because um, we're trying to politicize it ourselves, but just because we think it is such an important part of our foreign policy going forward. And uh, we are thinking about, you know, having positions um, that in, in embassies everywhere, you know, under this ESTH uh, rubric um, that uh, I think should stand the test of time. And uh, we had a very robust um, climate solutions caucus made up of a lot of Republican members of Congress at the last COP. We do outreach to the Republican members all the time. I think the things that are maybe more vulnerable are things like our donations to the big funds, uh, the big in financial institutions. Um, many Republicans might prefer um, bilateral or U.S. directed multilateral funding efforts to, and we think about these things in terms of not just climate, but biodiversity loss and uh, pandemic prevention. I think that also kind of spreads the risk of a big uh, slowdown in the work in this area. So we have naturally built up our work on biodiversity. We're hoping to get more funding for it. We're finding new avenues for working with um, partners on that. We're looking for private sector funding. So we are not, I think, going to um, be uh, vulnerable because we have thought about this in ways that um, kind of diversify uh, both the work and the funding for it. What barriers impede a rapid global deployment of climate solution technologies and how do we work to address them? 
And then related, the two part question, um, in what tangible ways can the Foreign Service foster leapfrogging technological advancement in low income countries? It's interesting. Um, I think uh, some of the biggest barriers are the risk in some of those low and um, uh, low income countries in um, parts of the world that aren't particularly stable. And that's what we need to fix in these uh, or, or evolve in the, the big financial institutions is their risk appetite. Now, part of that is US government funding going in as concessionary or you know, starting being the anchor fund so that then um, philanthropic and bank uh, big institution dollars can come behind us. I'll, I'll give you a good example. Last year, at the same time as these nations came and said, you got to step up your game, US in the Pacific Islands. Um, they said, literally, the Chinese write checks and you give us red tape. You know, they roll out the red carpet, you give us a lot of red tape. So that was a that was a wake up call. Um, at, at the same time, I was asking philanthropic organizations to help us create large scale marine reserves in the high seas of the Pacific Islands. There are a lot of kind of like pockets, like donut holes of international waters between the islands. And it would be really beneficial actually to create marine protected areas there. And those island nations would like us to create marine protected areas potentially in the high seas. So I said, but we need some philanthropic dollars, some real dollars to help conserve those areas permanently because they don't belong to anyone. So no one's gonna pay to conserve them other than maybe some big philanthropic donors. And they said, okay, but we need to see the US government's commitment to this region. And when we see the US government's commitment, then we'll follow in with more financing of our own. And so lo and behold, the you know, the dominoes fell into place where, you know, we upped our, um, our work in the Pacific uh, through U.S. government funding. And I hope that now, and I'm, I'm, I'm fairly optimistic that philanthropic dollars will follow, particularly if the island nations themselves come up with, uh, you know, um, plans for their big um, ocean economies that are sustainable and that include areas of marine protection, both inside, their domestic waters and internationally so that we actually make progress on both uh, sustaining their economies around the ocean and conserving parts of the ocean so that we don't use it up. And so I think that's really um, the key to, uh, you know, to, to making the, the, the things that we want to do stick. Changing uh, tax a little bit. Um... You just, we discussed this in the last question that I asked you um, about our, the workforce, but maybe you can just expand a little bit more about this. Um, can you talk about the opportunities for young people who are interested in developing careers that link environmental work and diplomacy? Um, for example, for students in environmental studies or political science, what recommendations would you have to enter the field? It's, it's funny you ask that question because I get that a lot given that I, when I taught in particular, I taught at Georgetown for seven exactly. years. I taught undergrads who, um, a class on ocean law and policy. And I, I just, it's a fun story. The end of the class, the last session of class was a simulation of the final negotiation of the Areas Beyond National Jurisdiction Treaty, which had been mm -hmm. sort of percolating the whole time I was teaching the class. And I, we, we set up, so I simulated last weekend seven times with students before we actually did it which was a great exercise actually in seeing yeah. how compromise is, is, um, is created. And uh, so I get the question a lot and I think the, that there's actually growing interest and people with this expertise occupying political jobs, you know, political cone or econ cone jobs is really critical because it's not enough to stovepipe it even in ESTH. We need to both build it in to um, other cones, um, the communications cone, again, public affairs. Oh my gosh, if we don't get the message out, we're gonna you know, be really regretting that we haven't fully educated people. So in other countries, they know a lot about this because they experience it daily, but thinking about the solutions and helping us to communicate that the US is actually there to help, that we are doing things in countries really matters so much. So I think, um, you know, the, the fact that um, 
people who have this interest want to join the Foreign Service, want to be a part of the, the bigger community through work in NGOs or at USAID um, or other agencies doing international work in this space is great. And the more we can encourage it, the better. And the more we can um, bring everybody else along, the better. Okay. Um... I'm looking at the time. We have maybe time for two more questions. So um, one question, maybe I'll combine two. I, I think this is from one of our members who's a little more familiar with um, the State Department work. So can you update us on the activities? You had mentioned um, the climate change foreign service officers that are deployed around uh, to our embassies. So update on that work and then related uh, any updates on environmental hubs that were um, established, I think, maybe, I don't know, a couple decades ago. Yeah, the hubs are great. Oh my gosh. That's uh, the, the ESTH officers and the, the whole network of people within the Foreign Service who are doing this work is kind of a secret that I, you know, I was so thrilled to find when I got to this job because they're pivotal. I can, I'll, I'll I don't want to name too many names, but Meredith Ryder Rood is our hub um, lead in, uh, I think, in Central America. She's based in Costa Rica. She's been phenomenal in helping us on a particular set of marine protected areas in four neighboring countries. And we're trying to now get the international waters that connect those four marine protected areas all protected as one big, giant, four country marine high seas and domestic reserve. She's been instrumental in that. And, uh, you know, that there's so much great work and things that you can accomplish out in the field. Um, and so those officers are pivotal. And I am continuing to make the case that we need them more than ever. We need to grow the number of ESTH officers. We need to grow the number of, um, of hub officers, you know, who, who can help. Because while these are global problems and we need global standards and global solutions, we also need regional, not just and not just local, but regional cooperation because IUU fishing is a perfect example, illegal, unregulated, unreported fishing. The, the bad guys know exactly how to move within the region between international waters and domestic waters over to the next country. They know exactly how to evade jurisdiction. So working regionally on enforcement is really, really important. I think there is a scale where we need, you know, kind of global efforts, like these big agreements, set the norms. Then we need multilateral cooperation within regions and then U.S. support in the field, country by country, to make it all work. We will not solve these problems without all three of those. Okay, so our last question is a little bit of a right turn, but I think it's an important one to address. You had mentioned the need for uh, World Bank or multilaterals, uh, the reform to their approach in sort of helping us address the climate crisis. So maybe um, the question goes, can you talk to us about how the US is involved in reforming the World Bank um, in line with the ideas of the Bridgetown Initiative? And is this something that can be moved forward through international cooperation? I think um, we're involved in many different ways. Obviously, Treasury leads on those things, but we have the on the ground, you know, um, diplomatic experience to help uh, inform that. And the place where we have the most direct capacity, well, two, two things. This year, we had a Jeff Global Environment Facility replenishment um, last April. We uh, made a huge increase in our contribution and we put half of it on nature and biodiversity. Um, and the fund itself will spend a huge amount um, on nature and biodiversity. So that's gonna have huge nature benefits, huge uh, benefits for um, uh, zoonotic spillover, huge benefits for uh, climate as well. And, um, and they are working very hard to change the way their application process goes to make it easier, for small grants to take in, also to allow them with, within certain funds to take in external funding. They're working very hard at making some of those reforms. I think that's gonna be infectious because the Green Climate Fund also needs to make some you know, adjustments to make sure that they're hitting their marks. 
It's also interesting that the U.S. shared, or it's the co-chair of the Green Climate Fund board this year. That gives us another big opportunity, particularly working with um, countries, both the recipient countries and the donor countries that are on the board to make some of those changes. And there's been a lot of discussion of it um, in the media. Uh, we know the Treasury Secretary is there. We know, we know that this is the time. We have a new World Bank president you know, on deck. Um, so this, again, it's another thing that we can do at this moment to make sure that the funds that we have dedicated to this work are actually getting to where they need to go and that the U.S. is getting the proper credit. We are not the only ones, but we are making a big contribution. And um, I hope that, you know, in a couple of years when we look back, we'll have, we'll have evolved those to a place where they're, um, they're, they're doing more for us. We're getting more bang for those bucks. Thank you so much. I'm looking at the time, we're at time. So I would like to wow. hand back to Ambassador Rubin um, uh, for last remarks. Thank you so much. And um, first of all, let me thank uh, Assistant Secretary Medina for really an amazing, fascinating discussion. I think I've learned more in the past hour than I have from, from any of our discussions. So thank you. Um, and, and these issues are so important. So I think for all of our members <clears throat> who are participating, thank you very much. I also want to thank Nadia for doing such a great job um, moderating and doing questions and putting this all together. Um, I think it, it really has been one of the, the most successful uh, events that we've done. And let me just say, um, for AFSA, we, we don't get involved in policy debates, but we do support diplomacy. All of our members and all of our colleagues who are out there doing the hard work, and I think we've discussed in the past hour how important the work of diplomacy is and how critical it is. And, and actually without our career professionals, there would not be this diplomacy. And frankly, we wouldn't have a chance to make progress on this critical set of issues that's gonna define whether our planet survives or not. Uh, that's how I see it. So um, thank you to everyone who's played a role in that. Um, but once again, thank you to Assistant Secretary Medina. We are truly grateful that you chose to spend an hour with us. Um, I think we've all learned a lot, and um, and I think we're all hopefully committed to to making progress on this whole set of issues. It's a lot, I know, but um, it's critical. So um, thank you, and uh, let me hand back to Nadia for some final remarks, but I also want to just thank all of our members for your support, and uh, and I look forward to more great events like this. Of course, I was on mute. Uh, thank you, Eric. And I do want to make uh, sure, uh, Assistant Secretary Medina, that um, we haven't left anything off the table in terms if there are any final words you'd like to say. Thank you for being such a fantastic guest and truly, I think, helping us walk through this enormous uh, field, no pun intended. Uh, <laughs> Thank you so much, Nadia. Your questions were great. Thank you to the audience. Wonderful questions. I love this. This was so much fun. Um, thanks for inviting me. Thank you, Ambassador, for hosting us. And I think what I would say is everybody can make a difference. Every single one of, of you out there can help us with this um, in very, very important uh, cause. And if we do, if we all work together, we can make this a much healthier and more sustainable planet for our children and our grandchildren. I know that's what motivates me and I know it motivates all of you. So thank you for everything you do and keep it up. Well, thank you. And with that, um, I would like to bring Inside Diplomacy uh, to a close today. Thanks for everyone who participated today. And if you're not a member of AFSA and you would like to be invited to future events, please email us at, at events at afsa.org. Thanks again to everyone and see you next time.